There she goes again from Marshall Crenshaw on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Marshall was on with us in the past and continues to record an eclectic array of originals and covers. He's a man who's played both Buddy Holly and John Lennon. Once again, Marshall's here with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio with some good news for fans and some new music. Welcome back to the show, Marshall. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for uh, inviting me. I have to add this, though, before we move on. I wanted to point out something I didn't get to say years back when you were on. Aside from the mm-hmm. Buddy Holly story movie, there were two other great portrayals of Buddy Holly on camera, at least my favorites. There was that guy who played a presumed dead Buddy Holly on The Young Ones with a parachute hanging upside down eating beetles. <laughs> Loved that guy. Yeah. And yours on La Bamba. Oh, okay. Well, thanks. I saw that. I used to watch The Young Ones. Uh, yep, one of my favorite my- shows. <laughs> yeah, my wife was fanatical about it, and I, I loved it too. So I know what you're talking about. I saw it myself. I was definitely a Rick guy. I was I was a Rick fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great that show. Cough, cough, cough. Oh my god. I was just watching a video, a 2012 video of Alexi Sale doing Dr. Martin's boots, and that brought back a lot of memories. I'm gonna have to pull those DVDs out again. <laughs> yeah, you know what? We have all the episodes. Back in the in the day, I used to record them on VHS tapes in case we missed it, you know, and we just wound up saving all of them. I haven't seen it since a long time ago, but uh, yeah, that was excellent. It was a great TV show. And uh, we used to catch it on MTV on Sunday nights. Yep, so I, I used to watch that, and that was back-to-back with either Monty Python or around IRS's The Cutting Edge, somewhere around that time, late night. Mm-hmm. I bring this up because you and Buddy Holly do have quite similar roots in what we'll say root rock or soul rock as well. Um, well, let me. Uh, you may have a point there. Let me see if I can wrap my mind around that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, now uh, I read that um, that they, that Buddy Holly and his friends, they and a lot of kids in the South and all across the U.S. back then, they discovered. R&B through this radio station called WLAC, which was, I think, out of Gallatin, Tennessee, or Nashville, Tennessee. And they used to have these radio stations back then, clear channel radio stations, where the signal didn't have much interference. And so it would carry all over the, the our part of the continent, you know. So over there in, there in Texas, they're broadcasting the show in Tennessee, but these kids in Texas would, you know, like sit out in somebody's car and listen to the show. That's when they fell in love with, you know, Hank Ballard and the Midnighters and Clyde McFadder and the Drifters and all that great stuff from back then. My dad used to listen to that radio station. He told me that when he first got out of the Navy, he was dividing his time between Flint, Michigan, where he grew up, and uh, I forget where in Florida he was going to college in florida after the, after world war ii so he'd be in florida or michigan and he could get that same station and, and he listened to that music too but uh anyway uh i just i heard buddy holly when i was a kid, little kid like a child when, when buddy was walking the earth i heard the records when they were new and they just came out you know so i mean it's just really part of my uh my DNA. Not that I know exactly what DNA is, but anyway, <laughs> it's it, yeah. I mean, I, I I've got as as strong a connection to that as I can imagine. Really, it's just like I love that music since day one. Really, and I you know I kind of understand the like you know the ingredients of it and the genesis of it and yada yada. You know, yeah. All the above. Marshall Crenshaw is with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. That brings me to the re-release of your 1996 album. That's coming soon. Miracle of Science is the album. And you're going to do this through your own, uh, your new shiny tone record imprint. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, as we speak, it's tomorrow. And that's the 17th of January. Um, if you live long enough and you're somebody like me, then you can like take repossession of... Uh, your intellectual property, you know, because of copyright laws and stuff, and uh, or or contracts or both or whatever. And uh, so I got these records back, 
that I made for Razor and Tie Records. And I made these in the 90s. I know we're talking about the 80s, but, uh, you know, I, I made this one, Miracle of Science, in 1996. And uh, and then there's more to follow. There's a five altogether that I did for the, for the label. But we're just kind of doing them one at a time. Miracle of Science uh, comes out tomorrow as a CD, and it comes out on all the digital platforms, and they're supposed to be vinyl, but that got kind of uh, jacked around, so the vinyl doesn't come out simultaneous with everything else like I hoped it would, but it'll be it'll be out soon. And uh, you mentioned Shiny Tone. That's my imprint. I made a distribution deal with this great record label called Megaforce, they're very cool, and uh, <clears throat> they told me that I needed to have an imprint. I'm like, what? I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I came up with the Shiny Tone. Yeah, that's a good a name. name for a record label. Yeah, yeah, I like it too. You're going digital to analog on this. I have to note that because you mentioned that uh, this will be released on vinyl soon enough. Uh, I understand it was never a record in the 1990s, unfortunately. No, none of my razor and tie stuff ever came out on CD. Because it's just like it wasn't even done then, you know, like people didn't really consider it. Well, albums had been mostly phased out at that time, so. You know, I'll never forget uh, the uh, Cub Scouts who came into uh, one of the old radio stations I, I worked at. I was I used to give the young Cub Scouts tours. It was a very local station, and one of those hyper-local stations, My the first one I ever got to run. We had a production room full of records, so I pulled one out and I said, does anybody know what this is? One, one smart-nosed kid raised his hand and said, yeah, that's what they used in the olden days. Yeah, <laughs> but young of people course. now well, are are appreciating right. that, and young people now are appreciating that sound, the, uh, the the smoothness of vinyl at this point. I guess yeah, it's popular for sure, and I I guess a lot of yeah, a lot of kids are into it for sure. I'm I'm glad that they came back. I understand the appeal of CDs, but I uh, I just uh, I really like the experience of playing a record and the way they sound and. Just the whole thing. I'm glad that they're around. I mean, what's wrong with having another choice in the marketplace, right? Exactly. Uh, I'm not on board with the cassette revival, though. I mean, somebody, it seems like they were trying to get that stirred up a little while ago, but I'm not, I wouldn't go there, but LPs, you know, I'm glad they're back just for my own taste. Yeah, and, and you can see the liner notes a lot easier on those things, but that's a different story for a different day. Miracle of Science is also special, Marshall, because you produced and played most of the instruments on that one as well. I did. I was uh, left to my own devices by Razor and Tie Records, which was really great. And, uh, you know, not that I didn't work with great A&R people at Warner Brothers. When I was at Warner Brothers, my a and person was a woman named Karen Bird, and I always named Chet her anymore. She was a great person. And we were friends. So I'm not complaining about her, but, uh, you know, it was great to get away from the major label system. I wanted to get away, you know, when I, I chose it, I chose to get away. And uh, the thing with Razor and Tie, I just was comfortable at the time and it made sense to me. And artistically, I think it was good too, you know. That album is really good. I mean, it just, I just did exactly what I thought I should do, you know, it wasn't filtered to anybody else's point of view. And I got, I was working with great people that could help me do the best that I could do, you know. Uh, so, uh, I, I, you know, I give it a thumbs up. Mir Miracle of Science was a good album for me. Good experience. Uh, all, that, all of the above. And, of course, the uh, lineup of musicians included a dobro player, so you got to like that. Yeah, well, that guy, uh, Greg Lees is his name, and he's played on every one of my records since 1991. He's also, like, you know, he's played with everybody you can think of. I mean, literally. And, uh, yeah, he's a real artiste, that Greg Lees, I'll tell you that. So, anyway, yeah, there's some dobro, there's a horn section on the same song there's real strings on another song there's Mellotron and all kinds of this and that and the other thing there's drum machines and live drums and mandolin everything I could think of or that I felt oh there's one track where I tap on wine bottles through the whole track so there's wine bottles on the album uh, yeah it just I was let loose you know <laughs> and the, and the 
on the toy store or whatever. Exactly, Marshall. So how did you become a stellar vibraphone player? Uh, you know, I, I just made it work because there was nobody else there to do it. That's all. And, uh, you know, it was a simple part. And uh, so I just did my Brian Jones thing, you know. Uh, I can, you know, I can get something out of this. And so here goes, you know. <laughs> I took piano lessons when I was 10 years old. So a vibraphone. I don't know. I just made it work because I had to make it work. <laughs> but I've had vibraphone on other records of mine. You know, I just like that is one of my favorite instruments. One of my favorite. Me too. I always believe there should be more trombones, bassoons, and vibraphones in music today. <laughs> that has to happen. I think so. You know, all goes too. That's what's missing right now. So. Marshall Crenshaw is with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Straight ahead, we're going to talk about the bonus tracks and a documentary Marshall's working on. From the 1996 and currently re-released album Miracle of Science from Marshall Crenshaw, 2541 on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Marshall, the re-release of Miracle of Science, which we've been talking about, will also feature two bonus tracks. One of them's a 1975 Canadian hit from Michelle Pagliaro. What made you reach back to 75 for that one? Well, I grew up in the Detroit area, and uh, the big top 40 station in the early 70s was CKLW over in... Uh, Windsor, Ontario, right? And uh, if you listen to their jingles, which you can find on YouTube, they say CKLW, the Motor City. So they were a Detroit station. I mean, they were in the Detroit market, but they were Canadian. And uh, they got laws over there to the north where uh, a Canadian content law. So CKLW had to play to like 20% Canadian content. And sometimes they would fudge it by playing like a Neil Young record or Alice Cooper who <laughs> went over to Toronto and recorded with a Canadian producer. You know, like they, they would fudge it sometimes, but they also played a lot of Canadian stuff, you know. And like back in the 70s, back in the 70s, you know, like the Guess Who and other Canadian acts started to have hits in the U.S. And that was because of CCLW. But anyway, uh, the record we're talking about, the one that I covered, it was just a thing that got played on CKLW, and I always thought it was great. You know, still like that's one of those records that you know over the years I play for somebody, knowing that they've never heard it before, and they're like, "Wow, this is a cool one." You know, and uh, that's it. It's just like that. You know, I just connected with the song, and you know, I'm fond of it, and I just knew that I'd get a kick out of it doing a version of it. So that's that. One of the great things about living near the Canadian border is being able to hear those radio stations from the Great White North. I did spend a short while living near the uh, where I could hear a CFNY. I was in an up, way upstate western New York. That was a good station. Mm. You could be exposed to music program direct. Is, is music U.S. program directors really couldn't play? And as 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 you mentioned, twenty percent had to be from Canada. So we got to hear the Spoons, uh, uh, the Kings, a lot of other good bands in the eighties. You living in Michigan must have been blessed with the Detroit regional, U.S. national, and Canadian rockers available to you. So that's kind of like the best of all sorts of worlds there. Pretty good, yeah, definitely. And the other thing was CKLW had a TV station too, and so you know I grew up with a lot of like Canadian kids shows. Like there was one called Razzle Dazzle that I liked and then there was this one about truck drivers called Cannonball and then later on you know they played a lot of British films you know stuff that I might not have seen on the local Detroit stations like uh, Ealing films and stuff you know just kind of British stuff that I liked I'm, I'm kind of a I'm a movie buff I always have been so CKLW is, it was interesting it just sort of added to the cultural diversity of the Detroit area in a good way. And uh, the radio station was great. The music director was this woman named Rosalie Trombley, and she was single-handedly responsible for what got played on the station. She didn't use call-out research, and she didn't have consultants or anything. She just did it all herself. It's like, if I like it, I'm putting it on the air. That's the and way that radio should she be She just happened to have really great taste. You know, she was better than all the people that use call out research and, and consultants. She just was better than them, you know. I dug it. It was great. CKLW. I have fine memories of it. Marshall Crenshaw is with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. The other bonus track is Daniel Wiley's Misty Dreamer. How did you come about deciding to record a version of that one? Well, Daniel, somebody I saw in the um, 
he reached out to me on Facebook. I used to be on Facebook, and uh, I just heard from him out of the blue one day. He told me this whole story about how he'd seen me on uh, this UK TV show called The Old Grey Whistle Test, and just became a fan and remained a fan. And that just kind of stirred up a lot of uh, memories and, you know, kind of like hit me emotionally because he's an artist himself, you know. Daniel's had some hit records over there and is a great, you know, great singer, songwriter, and record maker. I so just kind of dug it, you know, that he had uh, written me this nice note, uh, made me feel good. So I, just, I know his stuff, you know, I think, well, I'm going to check his stuff out too. And that's just one of the songs of his that I love. I, I thought it, you know, I thought it, it kind of resonated. You know, it talks about, or it touches on stuff that's going on in our society. I don't want to get too obscure here, but anyway, I just thought that the song had a kind of a, like a currency about it. And it's it's bittersweet, you know. Emotionally, I dug it, and uh, and then we just tried it, you know. Me and Rich Pagano and Andy York, those are a couple of musicians I work with all the time. And uh, that was it. We just got into it. We took it. The the feel of it on our version is different from Daniel's. He goes into an up tempo thing midway through. We just kept it in this kind of druggy groove. Mm-hmm. I'd say. You know, 70s kind of drug groove. But uh, uh, that, that's it. We just had fun with it is what we did, even though it's, again, it's kind of a dark song a little bit. It's it's beautiful and dark all at once. Daniel Wiley. I'm, just, I'm putting in a plug for Daniel Wiley, by the way. If you're uh, interested in hearing some good stuff, you might want to check him out. Yeah, I... You know what? You learn a new thing every day. I'm going to be listening to more of Daniel Wiley. That's going to happen. Yeah, you won't be sorry. I promise. I know what you, I know what you like, and you're going to like him. There we go. <laughs> Marshall Crenshaw is with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. You do quite a bit of covers, but your originals are also covered quite a bit of note. You've been covered a lot by Ronnie Spector. That was uh, That's interesting. That was nice. And uh, I'm definitely a Ronnie Spector yeah. guy. I love her voice. Yeah, I, I went nuts and, you know, I went to school on those Phil Spector records once upon a time. And I heard them when they were new, too, you know, but then kind of revisited them after the fact. So, uh, I, you know, I met Ronnie. Uh, it just so happened that I met her through this guy, Alan Bedrock, who I worked with. He, Alan released my first record back in 1981. My first single, it was, it was not an album, but anyway, um, he produced Ronnie, you know, some tracks by her and played her a bunch of tunes. Like he said, he played her in like 25 songs. All the ones that she chose were my songs, and I, so I was really pleased because I was a fan of hers already, still am. Um, yeah, you know, the, I mean, now that you mentioned that, you know, right at the time that Miracle of Science was being recorded, uh, was around the same time as Till I Hear From You by the Gin Blossoms was on the radio constantly. So that put me in a, in a really good mood. <laughs> this cover, and this song that I told me, I hear it on the radio. Every time I turned on the radio, it was on. So um, that Miracle of Science is from right around that same time frame as the Gin Blossoms thing. Marshall, are you still working with the Smithereens? Yeah, I am. I've got a gig with them this weekend. I'm filling in for uh, Pat Denizio, who can't make it to the shows anymore. But uh, speaking of the Gin Blossoms, it's it's usually it's always either me singing or Robin Wilson from the Gin Blossoms. Mm. The guys, you know, Pat. I'm sorry, uh, Dennis, Dennis, Mike, and Jimmy. They're uh, they're just a great rock and roll entity unto themselves. The three of them, and it's Pat's songs, which are great. And so uh, it's, it's so much fun for me, too. You know, it's like no pressure. Well, not much pressure, anyway. And uh, just playing with a great rock and roll band. 
nice little side trip for me. I love it. And what's this I hear about a documentary you're working on about producer Tom Wilson? Oh, well, you're absolutely right. I've been uh, attempting to create this documentary, uh, and it's going it's going well. You know, I don't want to overstate it, but it, it is. It's, it's looking like this. I mean, I really am sure that this is the year that it's going to get finished or I'm going to die trying. Uh, everything's lining up. You know, I have a really good team of people. All along, I wanted to just sort of get it to a place where where it just had its own momentum. And now I'm, I feel like it's, you know, it's gotten there. But uh, anyway, Tom Wilson, it's like it's a name everybody should know. Every person that digs popular music and rock music should just already know this guy's name. And it's crazy to me that they don't. But, uh, you know, he was... Uh, well, let's see. He graduated from Harvard in '54. He established a jazz record label after that called Transition Records, which is a really important label historically. Discovered an artist named Cecil Taylor, who's import, really important, and uh, also established a thing with Sun Ra and the orchestra. They're really important. Every they should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Sun Ra and the orchestra. Anyway. Uh, Tom Wilson. After that, a couple of years after that, he hooked, he got a gig at Columbia Records, and they assigned him to work with Bob Dylan, who was new at that time. And then Wilson was Dylan's producer from Masters of War through to like a Rolling Stone, which is a pretty momentous stretch of Dylan's work for sure. And uh, that's music that really stood popular music on its head. Wilson was, you know, part of that whole period. After that, he just he kind of invented Simon and Garfunkel, caused them to uh, reunite and become Simon and Garfunkel. They they worked together. They recorded as Tom and Jerry when they were in high school, and you know again the way that they sort of became Simon and Garfunkel it was through Tom was because of Tom Wilson. Uh, you could say that, um, and then after that, Wilson went to. He went to MGM Verve Records and signed his first couple of signings were the Velvet Underground and Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. And neither one of those acts was going to get anywhere without Tom Wilson. So he discovered both of them. And then just sort of like as a side thing, he produced about a dozen hit records by Eric Burton and the Animals. And there's like, you know, 20 more I could name that are important. But anyhow, Tom Wilson, I I call that I call him a game changer, a game changing figure in popular music as we know it. That's that's for sure. I mean, I have no, I I can't even. Nobody can really even imagine what popular music would be without the Velvet Underground and Zappa and Simon and Garfunkel and Bob Dylan and Cecil Taylor and Sun Ra. It's just like this guy opened Pandora's box all those different times, you know, this one person. And he was a really interesting, really interesting person too. His life story is a really wonderful story. We need visionaries like Tom Wilson all the time. So, yes. Plus, it's wrong that people don't know about him too. And that they, Like, everybody can name five or six record producers, and he should be one of those five or six, I think. On the other hand, a producer is somebody who really should go with the philosophy it doesn't matter who gets the credit. So the sign of a great producer is somebody who really isn't well-known uh, or isn't a household name but makes things happen. Well, that's interesting because, I mean, his modus operandi sort of changed according to what the situation was. And uh, there were, you know, like that was an approach that he used sometimes was just to sort of let the session happen and then he would kind of deal with it later on, you know, like not his, he was, he had a real ethos about not interfering with the musician's process. That was part of his ethos, but uh, he could also be really hands-on too. If he was powerful, he was, he was great. One of the best ever, uh, whatever the, whatever the situation called for. I'm a big fan, as you can tell. Oh, yes. But uh, I think other people are going to be fans, too. More people are going to be fans when we get this thing out the door. 
We're looking forward to seeing the documentary, Marshall, and hopefully it'll be out and ready when you're, uh, well, very soon. Marshall Crenshaw, thank you again for being with us on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Well, thank you, Chris. Thanks for again, Thanks for asking me, and thanks for shedding some light on this whole thing. I appreciate that. And uh, best wishes to you. Thank you, and good luck with the re-releases, the documentary, and work with the smithereens, among all else. Let's play one of the bonus tracks from the new re-release of Miracle of Science, Misty Dreamer, new from Marshall Crenshaw.